Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. Today, we have guest Nathan Howe. Nathan, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. It is so good to have you here. Um, We worked together years ago, and we'll talk about uh, where we worked, but uh, what's it like now, today, 2022? You are an administrator now. What is it like? Is it all negative? Is it all post-apocalyptic? No. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, we see how the culture has changed. We see the news. Uh, we hear the narrative over and over again. Uh, but one thing that hasn't changed, and in some ways it's been pronounced and emphasized and illuminated if you're just paying attention uh the beauty that people have and 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 the power that children have so you know i you know this past week we had protesters at school for masks parent protesters um with uh, bringing photocopies of of gavin gavin newsom and eric garcetti with magic johnson at so I was like, thanks guys. You just made my, my job even that much harder. So, um, but, but, but but just even in that, um, those kind of tense moments where we had parents protesting, if you want to see civility right now, just pay attention to how the kids are behaving. And in Mm. so many ways, they're examples for us. What a good word. Nice word. Um, And we're, we're blessed to be in school. Um, You know, I'm in Southern Orange County. I lived in LA for over 20 years. And this has nothing, it's outside of the realm of politics. It just happened to be with how how it transpired with my district and the number of infections in Orange County. But our kids have been in school in person since October 1st of 2020. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I and I kind of feel like uh, I don't want our parents to ever lose sight of how lucky we are. Uh, I I transitioned um, to this district um, in the fall of 2020, and you know my former students. I mean, like all the other students in LA County, um, they were off campus for over 13 months. So yeah, it was tough. Those are tough months. <laughs> I do. That is interesting that um, that you've been in on campus since October of 2020. Um, so you pr- you guys pretty much didn't miss a beat. You you uh, I know there was the lockdown in March, but um, but relatively short short time compared to the rest of us. But um, I do want to say something um, when we were off when we were off camera or not recording. Um, I asked about your admin. Now, I knew Nathan um, as a teacher. We were fellow teachers, and I asked you what the transition must be interesting because as an admin, you have to be all things to all people. You, you, you have a different role, and you mentioned that you, you've softened your edges since the time I knew you, but I, w- I want to say my perception of you is very optim- That My perception of you is you're an optimistic person. You're a person with energy and you used to take the students very seriously. I mean, you could joke, and I saw that side of you, but you you took your job and, and the lesson plans that I saw, I used to walk in, um, and I really appreciated that about you, but uh I didn't see I didn't see the rough edges <laughs> that you were mentioning, but um but of course everybody has political debates and discussions and that came out sometimes, but I, I do want to mention that's my perception of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I say when I when before we started this interview, I I guess when I talked about my corners being rounded, it's just um, being able to catch yourself or being able to prioritize what really matters and being a big picture person instead of getting caught in, in, in some of these things in the moment. And one of the things that I've learned over time as a man trying to be the best man he can be, but also an administrator, you gotta, you gotta decide which, okay, is that a glass ball or is that a rubber ball? And, you know, and, and, and then you gotta assess that for yourself, but then you also have to assess that when you're dealing with other people and when, 
you're dealing with uh, developing curriculum and programming, especially for those disenfranchised students who have been invisible for years, and it's your job to be the one to uh, bring the invisible out and make it possible. So. Now, did you work with like special needs kids when you were there? Because it sounds like you're, when you say invisible, is that special needs kids? Is that the yeah, kids? Yeah, it's not just that, but I do have that lens. So it's, there's a, you know, it's like, um, I didn't plan any of this. And in fact, I didn't even plan like who I would, I didn't, I mean, Ruben and I worked together at a non-public school. Sure. I really didn't even try to work there. It, it just, <laughs> I, and we don't have time for that. But my career in education without any kind of planning has been, which is ironic because historically I'm not a laid back guy, but, uh, you know, but, but, you know, karma and, and the universe is, you know, Jim Carrey and all these other actors now say the universe, but it, it my, my career has been like, the, you know, like Forrest Gump's box of chocolates. And really? like even my transition to this district, I, my last eight years of teaching were junior high. Uh, my oh, first few yeah. years as an assistant principal were junior high. And when I applied to this district, I applied for a middle school position and an elementary school position. And they interviewed me for the elementary, and then here we go. And I taught elementary in a former life after Ruben and I taught each other. Wow. But, but I, was, uh, I was not a successful student uh, for many years. Uh, I was in remedial tracking. I had complete... I had no academic competence. And it wasn't until some... Um, watershed moments happened to me later and I was getting towards the end of my scholastic career prior to uh, moving on to undergraduate college but it, it just wasn't happening for me and uh, that's a whole long story you can ask me questions about that if we have time but I just I'm talking too much so I just want to oh no that's what we have you here for <laughs> I, I actually yeah, that's great. Yeah, I so I was, a... uh, I wanted to go, I grew up in Iowa, I wanted to go to the University of Iowa because they had, you know, the Iowa Writers Workshop, and I wanted to be an English major, and my, I took the ACT, and, uh, and I was scared out of my mind when I took it, and I took it a second time, I did even worse the second time. My score wasn't good enough to get into Iowa. So my mom was a professor of social work at a small college in my hometown and the sister school, which was a block away. Uh, my dad went there, he played intramurals with Greg Gumbel, by the way, at Morris College and Don Amici uh, <laughs> from Trading Places fame for people that are oh, yeah. uh, Gen Xers oh, yeah. like us, uh, he went there. But anyway, I went there under the auspices of academic probation and and I had wanderlust in my blood. So now I'm in like, I'm at this college a block away. I'm on academic probe. I'm in a fifth story dorm room and I can see the roof of my parents' house from it. And my roommate is from Japan. So I just was like, just shaking my head. I'm like, this is not like how I wanted, to, wanted it to go, but you know, I got good grades and I, and then I transferred to Iowa, but ironically, and I've talked about like those, those watershed moments. And some of these moments I share with my teachers and I've shared with my students. Um, but the first day of college at Loris College, that small Catholic college a block away from my parents' house, I walked into the composition class and Dr. Donna Bowerly said, hey, this is composition one, you're gonna be writing a lot. And she handed out those little blue books and she said you're going to write for the next hour and 20 minutes that was it and she was a former nun and i went to catholic school for 12 years so i'm a fear-based person still i got a little more faith in me but uh but no one questioned her and we just wrote for an hour and 20 minutes i got called into her office the next day and, and she said verbatim she goes what the hell is this and i said oh my god in my head i'm like oh my god i'm in trouble again this isn't gonna be good and she said, I don't know what's going on here, but do you know that the class you were in, it was remedial composition? I said, I didn't know that, but it's not surprising because that's where I've been for the last 12 years. She goes, I already changed your schedule. You're going to the honors group. And, uh, and then, you know, that was it. So then I got good grades. Anyway, jump cut, and I'll just kind of bookend it with this. Everything I wrote in particular uh, as a junior in my composition class, everything I wrote, I got a C on. I got so fed up with it, I told my mom, I said, I'm gonna have you writing the next paper. My mom was like scared that I was just gonna drop out of high school. She wrote the paper, she got a C. My mom is like, 
a professor and a voracious reader. Anyway, jump cut 10 years later, I got a cousin that rode the bench on the football team and his head football coach was my former composition coach. My cousin never played, graduates from, from high school, doesn't have a college plan yet. And he goes to this like weightlifting competition and this person sees him and it's the strength coach from the University of Iowa. And he goes, who's that? To my, his older brother, my other cousin, he goes, oh, that's my, bro my brother, Pete. And he goes, uh, do you have any tape on him? And he goes, I don't have any tape on him because he didn't play, but I can get some tape on him and I'll send it to you. They sent tape on him. He got called up for practice the night before uh, the first practice of the season, walked on at Iowa, got partial scholarship, got full scholarship, became all Big Ten and got drafted by the Oakland Raiders. <laughs> so anyway, years later, wow. I got into Columbia's journalism school. You know, I got into an Ivy League journalism school. He got drafted by the Raiders, and we got the same person that's, that didn't see us. So, but on the flip end, go to Donner, Dr. Donna Bowerly. You can, you like, you know, as teachers, we have to be so aware of what's going on oh, and as yeah. educators and people. And it, if we are, we can be that person. Sure. That makes a huge difference. It's, would you, would you say that, uh, because I was going to ask you later about your mentor, but who would you say, would you look at that doc, doctor, you said Dr. Donna Bowerly? Dr. Donna Bowerly, yeah. Would you consider that person as your life mentor or was there somebody else? No, that's an example. She's an example for me. And it, it's someone who, and I've got a couple of other people uh, parallel to her that I'm grateful for. Um, but uh, you know, it's interesting because uh, I, I also was kind of going back to kind of being, a, you know, not a very confident kid. And I also was like different for Iowa. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I wanted to, you know, wear like uh, suits the color of Sherbert and hang out with Duran Duran. You know what I mean? And that wasn't what's happening in Iowa. So, <laughs> yeah. So um, I... The funny thing is, is some of my friends that, that I didn't make in, or and, and, until the, like the late 80s and until I went off to college, like some of my my friends later in life, I was like, I had an idea of who I wanted to, what I wanted to be like. And then I met examples of that. And I feel like I, I, you know, I took notes. I had it in my heart and it was, and the, the blueprint was already there, but I've just tried to emulate uh, some of the people that have been around me um, that had the qualities that I wanted to carry out as a young man. But I have, um, I have a mentor uh, in my new district. Uh, she's a seasoned principal. So that's like one of my mentors right now. But yeah. And, and you, oh, go on, Jacob. Sorry. Honestly, and those other people are more like, maybe like mentors of life, right? I mean, those are people that you're mentioning right now. You didn't mention their names, but there's a, those are people who just help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just what you know, like I grew up thinking like a lot of stuff wasn't possible, and then later I I found kindred spirits, but then they had this attitude that like like it, everything's possible, and mm -hmm. I didn't. That wasn't modeled for me until later, uh, and so like that that's been a guiding light through all of it. You, you know what we've noticed, Nathan, because we've we've talked to many many uh, we're coming up on a year since we started this podcast. Uh, but we've talked to several teachers who have stated that <clears throat> their mentors, one of their mentors were a fellow teacher, but they didn't even know it. So I have a, I have a suspicion that you've probably mentored people and you might not even know it <laughs> just from seeing your work at Aviva. And what about Aviva? What, what was it like now? I, I, we keep mentioning it, but I haven't described it. It's a school, you mentioned non-public school, it was an all girls school. Typically students had IEPs. So that's the special need component that Jacob mentioned, but all of them had been put in placement or just about all of them. Had yeah, been they were all adjudicated. They were all sent by the court system. And, and, and uh, would you say about half were removed from the home, which is a very difficult thing to do. Like it really has to be bad for a kid to be taken out of the home. What were some of the challenges working there? Yeah, the challenge, some of the challenges were, well, I mean, I worked there twice. So that was, when I worked with you, that was my second tour of duty. Um, I worked there and again, 
I didn't try to work there both times, but that's another thing. I, like we will have to meet again. I don't know. There's just too much there, but, but go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's so funny because as I'm talking to you, it, I, it dawned on me, Aviva was a very critical place for me because I didn't mean to work there either. And I didn't mean to get my special ed credential, but they Same. forced me to, but I'm so glad I got it. It made me yeah. a better educator. <laughs> yeah. So what was uh, the, uh, uh, what was hard about it and it in some ways I knew it was hard as a young man and now you know as a 50 year old man looking back I mean I was a white kid from Iowa I'd only been living in the state of California for two years I'd lived in San Francisco for two years moved to LA and my first teaching job is teaching a student population that has been disenfranchised domestically, financially, educationally, and a student population that is about 60% Hispanic, 40% African American. And, and, and there are all these things in, that, they, that they were going through and we, we were young and we had no training. Like there, there, there was a zero training. There was no professional development. We'd never had one professional development meeting. Jump into the fryer. Yeah, right into that. Wow. And, then, and, and there was no focus on the development of best practices with teaching. And there was this attitude where I felt like because things were so hard, you were low on the, they were low on the Maslow's period of needs. And so they, they, they didn't have any expectations for these kids. And I think that looking back, what needed to happen is that, that, that realization of, hey, what's really important? Them getting breakfast, them being safe. You know, those essentials, that is true. But in order to really help people, you have to empower them and not short them. And I felt like uh, the, the office there um, kind of, minimized what their potential could be. On the flip side, uh, the blessings there, the power there is that those girls that we work with transcended the borders of all the institutional um, uh, rules that were set by that organization and anybody else. Uh, they knew how to jump through the hoops. Um, they were just, just a light, a guiding light for all of us even though they were going through dark times, ironically. And the other thing that I loved is the colleagues. And I, and, and uh, Viva, I will say, was the toughest place I've ever worked um, in, in terms of really dealing with people that have real serious, like, concerns. Like, you know, we, we can debate masks or whatever. And I think about, you know, I, one of my first days at Aviva, I went into the staff lounge for the first time and I said, I, does anybody have Jocelyn? I've never seen a girl so tired. And they're like, oh yeah, she hooks at night with her mom. So, so to, to, yeah, just incredible. But the people that I worked with are, they were like flexible, like Gumby, you know what I mean? They could just bend and you know what I mean? They could, they could dodge a bullet and they could do it with humor. And I think that everybody there was funny in their own way. And, and I think that's how, that's why we really respected each other and why we enjoyed that journey together. And I think that that's what keeps our bond together. And I think that that was like beautiful music with the girls too. Like they were just as funny as, they were funnier than us. I mean, I remember ironically, again, like I, I taught, the one summer I taught a, a music elective called the, A History of Black Music and I was the instructor and this kid, this girl was looking at a teen magazine and she's looking at this picture of Andre 3000. And I got real quiet because, you know, Ruben alluded, I could, you know, I was funny, but I was serious as a heart right. attack. So, and I come from 12 years of Catholic school, and especially as a young man, those are some of the techniques that I was unfortunately using as a young teacher. I had to throw some of them, you know, out the window over the years, but that whole technique where the, the teacher's disappointed, someone's not paying attention to the lecture, and they get real quiet, and all of a sudden it's like earthquake weather. So even some of the girls, I got real quiet. I was getting that stern look on my face, and these girls are like, they're like, stop, stop, it's Mr. Howe, Mr. Howe, Mr. Howe, stop, stop, stop. And I said, that's it. I've, I've, I'm done. I've had enough. 
I've had enough. And I went over and I pointed at the magazine and she thought I was just going to light her up. And I said, Andre 3000, I'm completely insulted. He's taken my breaker name. I said, I don't know if you know those girls, but I used to be a break dancer. And I, and I was breaking with four plus one, four black guys and one white guy. And they were like, ah! they looked like they thought. And that was a technique that I didn't know. It was the accident. It was a training room. Oh, it, was, it was a laboratory for teaching. Because like, I, I didn't know what I was doing. And I did that. And I found out after they all laughed and, and could relate to me. And there was levity in the room. Because they needed levity in their lives and everything else. And again, they had bigger concerns than, you know, go, following like field songs to, you know, 90s hip hop. So, um, but by being humorous like that and, and going the opposite direction that I normally would have gone in, in that case, but I brought us together more and developed relationships. Sure. Uh, I was going to say, we, we haven't talked enough about this on the podcast, and that is what you just shared. That story where, where you, you described it perfectly, and, and I, I'll probably repeat it. <laughs> your, your story because when you're in a tense moment and you you want to teach or you want to discipline you throw it all out sometimes i know sometimes you can't do this but and you you say a joke that's funny and that's self-deprecating it's the one of the best things you best strategies you can do in moments like that bravo sir oh, yeah very no, good. well they taught me and it was it was humbling i mean i think it was the same class but different class session you know, I think like, and then you think like, oh, I'm relatable. I said, you know, I, and which is true. I did, I did, I was a break dancer and I did break with four okay. plus one. True story. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm in class one day and this girl, she just stops. Like, I'm in the middle. Again, I'm being earnest. I'm trying to do my best with the lecture and I got all my notes and I'm all prepared. And she goes, Mr. Howe, you're the whitest person I've ever met. They're, you're just <laughs> like how they are on TV. Oh, jeez. Oh, man. Yeah, there That's you go. Great. It's great because it, it we're, what we're trying to do, some new teachers watch this podcast. Um, so I, I, I just want to say that, Nathan, that um, it's, it's good stuff to, to learn this. And um, because what you're trying to do is get the student attention. How do you do it but break them, make them laugh? often at your expense and that's the key thing not at their expense at your expense in a way but um i really i dig it so oh, yeah. it's, it's something to uh think about certainly yeah and I, if i had any advice for young teachers it would be if, if you're if you think you're nervous as a new teacher you got kids that are way more nervous they they've never raised their hand mm -hmm. they don't have confidence and if you can try new things and show that you're brave on, on, on their behalf and working with them and getting them to the next level, that vulnerability will make you so much stronger as a teacher. You got to, what you want to get from them, you got to model it. And, you, and part of it is being vulnerable and trying things and not being afraid to try new things. And, and, and it may not work, but you know what will happen is your, te your students will see that. Yeah. And they, they're going to feel you, they're going to believe in you, and it'll come back on them. They'll start to believe in themselves. And you know, Nathan, I, I share this with, uh, new, I work with some new teachers right now, and I tell them all the time, they don't always remember, like 10 years from now, they'll visit you. They don't always remember the lessons, but they remember the relationship. They remember those conversations you had, the, the uplifting stories, the, the encouragement that when nobody else was giving it to them. Uh, those are the things they take away with them. And yeah, you hope they, they learn a couple of lessons, but that's not always the most important thing. Yeah, no, I had a powerful moment. You're right. I had a, they're not going to remember how great and well organized your, your lesson plan is. They're going to, they're, what they're going to remember is what you did on their behalf. Mm -hmm. What, if you made them laugh, if you taught them something, if mm -hmm. you fought for, for them. Um, I was, we were, when, when we went into lockdown, I live by the beach now and I'm walking on the beach in this guy in his 20s is he says hey mr howe and i'm like yeah I, hi but uh, who are you and he said you know and i, I won't say his name because you know i'm sure he he might watch this podcast so I'll keep his animated so he's the one he go ahead said his name and he said he goes my mom talks about you and i might cry but, and i don't want to cry on this thing but he goes my mom talks about you every week 
Like, and it, this is like 20 years later. He goes, she talks about you every week. She goes, Mr. Howe, move mountains for you, Jake. Um, but I remember I was in an I, I, he, well, he reminded me, I shouldn't say I remember, but he reminded me that we were in an IEP meeting and this goes back to trying to be the one. And again, I've made a million mistakes, so I'm not saying I'm all that. I'm, um, but I was in an IEP meeting and everybody was talking about how this kid never pays attention. He spaces out all the time and he's missing out on all this information. And he said, you told everybody at that meeting, it's not that he's not paying attention, but he's paying attention to, to something that he thinks is more important than what we're doing and talking about. And I said, he is not gonna have a regular, like post-industrial revolution job like us. He's gonna have some creative, out of the box job later. And I found out when he, after he said, you know, what he said about his mom, I said, so what are you doing? He goes, I trade cryptocurrency. And I, he's making more than the superintendent down here. And he's like 24, you know? <laughs> so, wow. again, you know, and the other thing is like, so then you look at, like you look at what, and what, you know, in education, we're all creatures of habit. You know, they, we got teachers teaching the same units at the same time of the year. And they're, and a lot of them are trying to teach the same way they did 20 years ago. And it's different. It's mm -hmm. changed. And, and you guys know this. It, the, the, I mean, you can't just keep doing the same old thing with different people. We have and, to mix it up. And you know, Nathan, um, I, I probably sound like a, a broken record. What's that? Uh, kids, one day I'll, I'll teach you what a record is. But um, <laughs> the the um, this is the year to experiment. This is the year to do something unusual. Admin won't be down your throat if if you're mixing it up and playing with the technologies and failing. It's okay to fail and to midway through a book say uh, this book's not happening. Let's change gears. They don't. They're not as concerned about that. Um, so. I, I agree. Let's do, let's mix it up. This is the year to do it. Yeah. Do you see that though, Nathan, as with your teachers, do they seem to be a little bit more, or are they still hesitant to make those changes or are they more like, Hey, you know what? I, I, I'm going to yeah, try something new. That's, a, that's an interesting question, Jacob, because it mm -hmm. kind of goes down to the two things that we've touched on earlier. And mm -hmm. that is uh, the school where I'm an AP uh, it's got a reputation of being the, like someone called it the redheaded stepchild of the elementary schools in my district. And I'm like, perfect. That's exactly where I want to be. <laughs> um, and we've over 27% of the student population on my campus is on an IEP. And um, it's more of a transient population. It happens to be a part of town where there are more apartment buildings. Uh, but that being said, these teachers are more flexible, malleable, driven, and driven to succeed. And in order to do that, driven to do whatever they can to mix it up to meet these kids' needs and get them going. And uh, That's great. there's still the universalism of uh, you've got people that you know that have, you know you might have you know the matriarch at the at the elementary school and they're like I've been here since they opened the doors and I've been doing this the way and then now you're coming in you're going to tell me this and they might say that directly or they may just say that through like their attitude and the way again like going back to what he said if okay if I want someone to change then I got to show that I'm willing to get there in the trenches and do all that. Mm -hmm. And then I have to have relationships. I have to. I have to make the. I have to make the matriarch laugh. Sure. You no, know, and I need to be in touch with her dreams and nightmares. And then you know, still, I can get them to move. It's still a little harder. And it's kind of going back to being a special ed teacher. You just have to repeat yourself a little more. There's more rehearsal in that. But um, but yeah, no, it's interesting, it and, and and it's. You know, and that's where some of the real challenges come. And then, you know, having some of those hard conversations and being honest and not just tiptoeing around it because you're there to help kids at the end of the day. And you, and you, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the bottom line. For sure. So um, similarly to how um, I have, I might have a plan and I say halfway through the lesson, I'm going to throw it all out. I had certain questions I, I had planned for you, Nathan, but I'm gonna throw some of them out. And I'm gonna ask this because you, you definitely seem to have a sensitivity to underserved 
communities, underserved students, students with IEPs, students from different backgrounds um, that aren't traditional, may not think a certain way. How does somebody have grow in sensitivity in that? Maybe a teacher wants to build that skill, doesn't see things like that, just sees the general ed, although that's not even becoming a thing anymore. What's general now? <laughs> but yeah. how would somebody, um, how would a, a young teacher look at things through that lens, build that skill? Well, there's a lot there. One, I want them, uh, and it kind of, one of your questions that you may have thrown out is uh, why I wanted to be an administrator. Um, yes. Um, so, so when you want somebody to see something and they're not seeing it, you got to get them off their island. And that's one of the hard things. That's one of the, I think, as you know, teachers, one of the things I think they really treasure is that they're, treasure, no pun intended, is that they're on an island. <laughs> uh, but then on the backside, it's a lonely feeling. Like they have their own little secret kingdom that they're able to create with their students and have the secret world and it's sacred. But then the drawback is they're on an island. And in order for them to see, they have to get outside of themselves. So that's going to be the focus. How do I get this person outside of themselves to see others? The first thing is, is I'm going to give them opportunities to remove them from their classroom and I'm going to put them into some other classroom where this teacher, that's what this teacher does. This teacher knows, this teacher has her finger on the pulse of the world of her <laughs> students and I'm going to put her in that classroom and then I'm going to, um, but I'm not just going to go, oh yeah, just go observe. No, I'm going to have very specific things that I want this teacher to hone in on okay. I'm going to give them that assignment. I want them to see these people and the dynamics and the relationships and the orchestrations in this classroom under the lens of these bullet points, these questions, these focal points. And then we're gonna, and then we're gonna have to talk about it, reflect on it. Cause even I can do that and I talk and I'm like, oh my gosh, you didn't, in my head, I'm like, oh my gosh, you didn't see that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it just takes time. And then, um, and then I, another thing I do sometimes is I'll go in there and, and teach their, their class and then they get awesome. See, and then they get to see their students react and behave differently with me. And they're like, and then they're like, what the what? Like, <laughs> I can't believe you got that kid to laugh or you got that kid to like do his assignment yeah. or, or wow, I just wouldn't have thought about it that way. Mm. We, we found the second unicorn, Jake. Yeah, we so have. this is great. This is, this is the second admin we've, we've found that teaches that, that will walk in we, we our friend paul does that too and it's such a beneficial thing and i yeah. wish more admins did it I, I when i went to school i, I got my uh, admin uh, credential and that was one of the my professor saying you know what one of the best things i do is go into classes and i teach you know just because for a lot of reasons but one of some of them what you're sharing and i go man if that ever is me i'm definitely gonna do that and not, now you're sharing and i go yeah it seems like it's a, a great strategy <laughs> awesome yeah. Wonderful. Now, um, let's, you, you see it more maybe than I do, Nathan, um, being an admin and talking to more teachers than I do, but um, we talk about burnout. I'm, I'm getting uh, emails and, and questions about mm. teachers just dropping out and burning out. Um, what is your favorite way to de-stress? Um, when you get anxiety, when you get frustrated and, um, and perhaps the teacher blues or admin blues start to creep? Yeah, a um, couple things. Uh, one is I think it's critical that it's not about how you de-stress after work. I think a lot of, I mean, that's true. We need to de-stress and have time to recharge the battery and all that. And that's critical. But I think one of the things that gets neglected is how we de-stress when we are actually in the trenches and are at school. And so I, when I'm at school, I want to have as much fun as possible. My focus is on having as much fun as possible and not taking like, like noticing the little things like the kid's shoes that are lighting up or a new haircut 
or just you it's there and if if you are going oh my god you're looking at your to-do list or you're like oh this these kids aren't listening or this whatever i just think if you gotta be able to find fun or you will never you're always gonna be reactive in terms of your stress management and we know that's never a good way to be with discipline with anything you are proactive and i think we need to be proactively enjoying and i think for the teachers that are having a hard time going back to that island music or island song idea but you just don't keep it to yourself talk about it you know and i think uh finding those people to talk about it and letting it out don't don't keep it to yourself and then finding ways to work and, and try not to man, like kind of not, not trying to manage it all on your own F mm -hmm. find that a partner at school find that colleague yeah you know because part of it is you know people feel helpless they feel alone and they feel not listened to um and i just think it's important to connect and share when you're when you're feeling that yeah absolutely thank you um, that's good important very important um okay um let's talk about music because one of the things I connect you is through music. By the way, you too, it looms large in my discussions with you and my memory of you. By the way, just real quickly, are you on team Joshua Tree or team Octon Baby? That, uh, I can, I'll have to answer it all. So if I were back in 1992, I would say Octoon Baby. And still, like in 2022, I would say Octune Baby, but I want to add to that. I think Octune Baby was the beginning of the group really kind of taking it to the next level uh, in terms of musicianship, in terms of uh, conceptual. Um, yeah, I, I honestly, I think the last two records they put out, I'll use records. Uh, <laughs> I think the last two records they put out are their best. And I think- Really? That, wow. Yeah, and like by far, in fact. And I think that it all comes down to the, the songwriting is in, incredible. Um, Bono's never written better songs. And the stage design, the live performance. So I have a, if you haven't seen this, I don't know if it's still on Netflix, but um, abstract the art of design season one uh, the stage designer Ez Devlin E.S. Devlin and she's our age um, I, I, I love what you just said because it's such heresy um, to say what you just said and I love it for just that you said that their last two albums are their very best I'm gonna pay attention to them I'm gonna I'm gonna listen to them very carefully this week and I love that yeah, no, those there's songs. I mean, there's some that are like, okay, yeah, okay, but they're on on the songs of uh, innocence and the songs of experience. There are times when I'm just like, the Paul Hughes, and he's killing me. He's killing me. It's like I wish that I had written that. And 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 all these years, I the, my favorite tour, and I saw the Joshua Tree tour, and I was a huge, and I still love the Joshua Tree. I was a huge oh, yeah. Joshua Tree. Man, I saw that that was my first U2 concert. It was the first time they ever played in Iowa. Um, but, and I saw um, Zoo TV twice. And, uh, and I thought that was great. Their, that was great. their best tour ever. And the last two tours killed it. Killed it. Wow. I love this. I, I, I love it. And I love, I'm going to tell people what you said because I can't wait to see the anger in their face. <laughs> yeah. uh, be, because there's some people who believe. Um, that yeah. you two ended with uh, Actum Baby. Hmm. But um, I remember you and I talking about how to dismantle an atomic bomb and how you were really, you and I were both really loving it. Um, so there is life after Actum Baby, people. Okay. Yeah, well, there's a lot of people I went to high school with that it ended after the, the Joshua Tree. Once they went another direction and went Actum Baby, but... Um, You're right. You're right. Yeah, I've heard people say that too. You're, uh, Joshua Tree, it ended with that. Ridiculous. Um, okay, let's get your, and I want to hear you chime in too, Jacob, with your top five Spotify songs that reflect your current mood and taste. 
Okay, that is that is very difficult. Very difficult. <laughs> so it's, it's like top five now. Although a cu- couple of them will always just stay in my top five, whether it's the song or it's the record. Yep. A couple of things I gotta just tell you. Current mood is, and this is before you know I knew I was gonna be meeting with you guys, but uh, you know my favorite sunsets down here in, at the ocean are in the winter. And uh, on Fridays, especially, like I like to pour a glass of wine, have my music on, I'm on the deck and I'm looking at the water and the sunset. And I I had the perfect experience on Friday where it wasn't the playlist. I listened to the, from the first track to the last track, the sunset, it ended perfectly. And it was Roxy Music's Avalon. Okay. It's sonically, it's an absolute gem. It's a, it's a perfect album. I, there are a few in my lifetime. That's one of them, Prince's Purple Rain. I can listen to that thing for the first note all the way to the last note. But going back to you too and bringing it back to Roxy Music, and I will talk Spotify like I'm not a 50 year old man stuck in the 80s, um, but <laughs> which I am. But. Um, <laughs> But real good, real good. The guy who the guy who produced Avalon is Rhett Davy, um, and U two when they were changing their they wanted to change their sound after the first three albums, which were produced by Steve Lillywhite. Unforgettable Fire was produced by Daniel Lenoir, an unknown at the time French Canadian producer who had gotten his break with uh, Martha and the Muffins, a Canadian uh, alternate alternative group. And then- That's why uh, I love Nathan. This is, this is one of the reasons I love Nathan. Go on. He's going in the weeds, I like it. Anyway, Rhett Davies, unavailable, not interested. And he, and, and, and he said, you might want to call Brian meaning Brian Eno, because Brian Eno was in Roxy Music in the early stages of that band. And then Eno went on to produce like Devo and the Talking Heads, Remain in Light, and like some of their earlier records, songs about buildings and food. Um, Anyway, so you two wanted to change their, they were so inspired by the sonic genius of Rhett Davies on Avalon that that's the direction they wanted to go. And it's interesting because then they got Lanois and Eno and kind of in so many ways uh, like made, like that was the, the kind of the sonic armature in which they developed their sound with those two producers and the rest is history. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been, and this is unlike me, like, so it's been cool in recent weeks to just listen to an entire album and not skip around. And um, I've really cherished that. But in terms of like, you know, five songs, I've been really into rock steady, like reggae music, rock steady. So I'll say like uh, the Heptones, like Book of Rules. I got to throw it back to Brian Ferry off the solo record. um, uh, Don't Stop the Dance, because I'm a big Nile Rodgers fan. And he came up with the guitar lick on that track. Uh, for Don't Stop the Dance. Um, also, bringing it back to Talking Heads, the Avalon is all this, and this is, the, all these people are all interrelated, and that's one of the powers of music that I try to put into my practice as an administrator. We might be all different, but man, we're all interconnected somehow. So like, so like Br- Brian Ferry, who is in Roxy Music, and, and also did the solo record, uh, Boys and Girls, that was recorded at Compass Point Studios, and that's where the Talking Heads recorded some of their work. Uh, even Foreigner recorded, like, Waiting for a Girl Like You, parts of it there, and an unknown um, synth guy by the name of Thomas Dolby does the intro synth sound on Waiting for a Girl Like You. He left the house at, like, age 16, lived on his own in London, and they flew him over to New York at 18 to do the synth sound because he made a name for himself. I'm digressing. I need to just talk <laughs> some So the hot, Heptones Book of Rules, Brian Ferry's Don't Stop the Dance, Prince, Take Me With You. Um, and I got to throw this good left field, but I just – everything's been so serious lately. Like, uh, Dua Lipa's Don't Stop Now. I'll throw that one in there. And I just started dating a woman and she's big into Beyonce. So I'm getting kind of a Beyonce education. And I like the concept 
of the Lemonade album and the concept of how that relates to what's going on right now. Did you just say you just started dating a woman? I did, yeah, yeah. Oh, Matt, I, I definitely haven't talked to you in a while. Um, yeah. Because, okay, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, cool. Mr. Howard needs to leave it like that for now, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, interesting. Very cool. I knew I'd get a very eclectic list and wow. strange list, which is good. I like that. Um, okay. Let's go with Jake. What's your Spotify? You know, I, I'm going to change it just a little bit like Nathan. I, I, I've been listening to albums, and I don't always do that, Nathan. Just I've been listening to a lot of uh, um, chili, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, um, Brandy Carlisle. Uh, I've been listening to a lot of um, Tom Petty. He's one of my favorites. I, I regret not going to see him. I, I almost went to see him on his last concert, and it was a school night, oh, and I regret it because it was a school oh, night. Yeah. I'm like, oh. And, uh, um, of course. Oh, they, what? Yeah, I know. The Avid Brothers. And this is kind of my – I've been listening to – I know my kids love Olivia Rodrigo, so I've been listening to a little bit of her. Um, oh, no. I know. <laughs> Why did you ruin this discussion? I know. I'm sorry. But I, I – you know, a little guilty pleasure i'm sorry so i'll leave it there but i've been listening to just like you're sharing just those albums because you know it's funny how we don't always do that anymore we just listen to the songs but when you hear the whole album you get the feel of it like the whole you know just what they're trying to do with it you know so yeah, and, and, and in some case i mean a lot of cases not some cases they're they really are telling a story yes. and that's empirically like like somebody going back to am i still being recorded yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and I wasn't. I wasn't gonna go rogue, but I just didn't want to bore people with the music stuff because I can get way. I can myself get to the weeds there. Yeah. But gro But talking about Duran Duran, and I, I, I'm a huge fan of Duran Duran. Oh, cool. And I've seen them a couple times live, and they're, they're absolutely phenomenal. And I would yeah. say not this last album they put out, but the one they put out in 2015. It's one of their best albums ever. Okay period the end but we live in this ageist society that doesn't take 50 year old rockers very seriously yeah um it's fantastic and the talent that they collaborate with is unbelievable so but i saw him once at the pomona at the fox theater in pomona and another time at the hollywood bowl phenomenal and uh but but i was going back to uh was it tom petty or no oh no the, the album thing so I wanted to, I didn't like anything that reminded me of blue collar or anything. So I, I, I did not gravitate to Springsteen at all. But when I was, uh, it was yeah, 92, man. I think the fall of 92 and some guy uh, said, you got to listen to this. And he gave me Tunnel of Love on cassette. And I listened to it and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Mm. And then I started listening to that. I could go way into detail on that, but just like real quick on Springsteen, just on the Born in the USA album, mm -hmm. there's a song called Downbound Train and Max Weinberg comes down on his drums like they're putting the, in the railroad ties. I mean, mm. sonically, it's just absolutely a gem. And lyrically, he gets away with this stuff that I have never heard any other songwriter get away with. Like he writes... He's, he, he's got the voice of a blue collar guy. He writes like a blue, blue collar guy. And in the middle of the song, he has this like, almost like this Shakespearean type line where he goes, nights as I sleep, I hear the whistle whine. And it goes on with this rhyme. And it's, it's just like a, right out of a, a Shakespearean sonnet. And so that's track five and that's called Downbound Train. And then the oh, next wow. song, the hit, one of the hit songs, um, uh, what is that called? Uh, I will say, I will say, Nathan, while you're thinking of it, I can see why you are an effective teacher <laughs> just from this. I just want to hear you. Yeah, I just want to hear your, <laughs> your, your details and your yeah, well, passion. Well, thank we talk, you. <laughs> we talk on this podcast about one of the strategies that are effective is the just the passion. Students will connect to that and want to read what you're reading or yeah. talk about what you're talking about. So we really see it right now. No, yeah, I thought of the <laughs> song, thank you. I just had a, a brain freeze, but so downbound train and then it goes into I'm on fire and it goes, wow. so if you listen to I'm on fire, if you just listen to it on the radio singularly, you might hear the train references or you might not, but just like, and even at the end he goes, woo, woo, woo. Oh yeah, yes. 
but when but that but all of a sudden that becomes more powerful when it's paired with the prior track and you're just like oh my god this guy is killing me <laughs> killing me and the other thing that that, that, that the springsteen example is for me is don't think you're not going to like something you might end up loving it you just have to listen and that's the that's you know the one of the lessons that you know you try to learn over the years. I was like that with David Bowie. I didn't get it before. And then when he passed away, I started listening to his stuff. I go, why didn't I not get this? Why? He's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wrote an essay on the Let's Dance record. I could send it to you. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just amazing. For my own well-being. I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> great. Uh, I'm, um, uh, oh, I forgot I'm, about you, Ruben. Yeah, go ahead. I, no, I was going to say, I, I actually like the pre-Bowie Let's Dance mm. better Although I do appreciate some of the tracks on that album, but um, uh, I can't go into the descriptions. Now I feel like my sad little playlist, <laughs> you know, but I'll just share my little playlist. No, I want you to share it because I want to write some of these down in okay. case I don't have it. Um, I, I want to say that the first song that comes into my mind is one of my favorite songs. And I like it so much that I like multiple versions of it. Um, it's Glenn Campbell's Gentle on My Mind, but I like mm. the band Perry playing it. I like Lucinda Williams' version. I like all versions. There's something so magical about those lyrics. Um, and they're so simple. Uh, and then uh, coming in at number two <laughs> is, um, is Right on Time, Brandy Carlisle. She's, she's nominated for um, a Grammy for the song. She has two songs nominated. You might as well, I might as well throw the other one in. Um, her other song, it's a, a duet with um, Alicia Keys called Beautiful Noise, but mm. her voice and her lyrics just, they just get me. She's the best. Um, and then we, just because of the, the date, today is February 6th, uh, tomorrow is February 7th, so Avid Brothers Day, the song February 7th, oh, but right. I could have I listed another 20 songs from them, but we'll call it February 7th, and then um, uh, I'm a, I do stand-up now, and I gotta get revved up, you know, for sometimes for, and I need a really crazy metal song to get me going. And so I picked Iron Maiden, Aces High. And then because we're in post-apocalyptic 2022, I got to get a real sad song, The Heartache. Nothing, nothing sadder than The Heartache by Warren Zevon. And I, that's, that's what I'm- That's saying. a good list, Rube. That's a good list. Wow. I like that. Very eclectic. I like it. Um, Thank you very much, Nathan. Wow. This has been such a pleasure. This is great. I really appreciate you joining us. And I've written so many things down. I'm going to, I have so much stuff to listen to. I'm excited about Tunnel of Love and the U2 albums. Yeah. Um, I've heard them before, but I want to really listen. You know, you know how you hear something, but you don't listen. I want to listen to them this week. And, and thank you for joining us. I really, we both really appreciate it. Thank you, Nathan. It. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, look forward to getting together, you guys, up in absolutely. LA sometime. Oh, we'll we'll make that happen for sure. And uh, thank you for joining us, everybody, for Pot and Deliver, and um, and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Bye.